on behalf of the governing board and all the members of the North American Catholicity Society, I would like to welcome you to Pittsburgh and to this 24th edition of the North American meeting. Um, we're hosted uh, during this week by the Pittsburgh Cleveland Catholicist Society. And on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank the organizing committee and its members for being so, so gracious and attentive uh, hosts. Um, so we gather together every two years or so. And you know, in doing that, uh, we do um, a very good job of sharing our science. We get to meet again and reconnect with old friends. And I think we all leave, I can say, in my case, with many new friends. I'd like to extend a particularly welcome, particular welcome to those of you who are here for the first time, okay? And especially for those of you graduate students that are beginning to enter the Catholicist community and will be with us longer than anybody else in, in this group today. Um, there, there is, however, a, a significant um, challenge that you all have ahead of you that the organizers of this meeting or those of us in the governing board cannot help you with. And that is that ultimately, except for a few of the operational details, the success of this meeting will depend on you and in what you do in your technical exchange and how you interact and how you network. And as a result of it, I, I leave you this morning with my best wishes for success in making this meeting your success. At this point, I would like to bring to the podium John Armour, who will introduce the award plenary speaker. Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann Gaffney today for her Hoodry Award lecture. Anne now joins an impressive list of world-class catalytic scientists and engineers. I cannot possibly do justice to her long list of significant accomplishments in my allotted two minutes, so allow me to highlight only a few of those. Anne has spent most of her more than 30 years in catalysis working in multiple industrial laboratories as well as serving as an executive in R&D. Currently, she has a new position as laboratory fellow and division director at the Idaho National Laboratory. She has a long record of invention, development, and publication of innovative chemical processes, which supports her recognition with the Eugene Hoodry Award for 2015. Anne has maintained a strong individual and collaborative technical focus, during which she has published more than 32 peer-reviewed journal articles, over 60 conference proceedings or articles, authored and edited numerous book chapters, presented over 95 seminars, and an inventor or co-inventor of over 150 U.S. patents. Anne has served the catalysis community in multiple ways as the Philadelphia Club representative for the, to the NACS for many years, the co-chair of the last World Ox Congress on Oxidation Catalysis, and the 19th NAM meeting chair. Recognition of her contributions to catalysis has previously been acknowledged by the ACS Award in Industrial Chemistry, the ACS Award for Affordable Green Chemistry, the ACS Distinguished Service Award of the Petroleum Division, the ACS Petroleum Chemistry Award, and the Philadelphia Catalysis Club Award. And the podium is yours with my personal congratulations. Thank you very much, John, and it's certainly a pleasure to be here and an honor to accept this grand award. Um, so today I'll be focusing in on selective oxidation catalysis. Uh, that's primarily where I spent most of my industrial career. And when I graduated from Delaware in 1981, a long time ago, I joined Atlantic Richfield and um, Arco Chemical Company. And at that time, a big 
project of theirs was taking remote gas and converting it to a transportable fuel. And during that time, we also discovered new catalysts for doing oxidative dehydrogenation. So you'll be hearing quite a bit about that today. And also at ARCO, spent quite a bit of time looking at direct epoxidation of propylene to propylene oxide. And um, as John mentioned, I worked at many different companies. I then moved on to DuPont when they owned Conoco and worked on partial oxidation of methane to syngas and then continued on to Roman Haas, now called Dow, or owned by Dow, and looked at propane to acrylic acid. Um, oops. Okay, so our first investigation was back in 1981, and at that time I discovered that lanthanide oxide, rare earth oxides, with promoters were very good for doing oxidative dehydrogenation. And even today, you can find quite a bit of literature um, on this chemistry. And currently, I, am, I joined Idaho National Labs in November 2014, and we're heading up a, an advanced manufacturing uh, center, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So what people might ask, well, why, why worry about selective oxidative dehydrogenation? Well, the uh, number one chemical today as a basic building block monomer is ethylene, and it's produced by uh, exo uh, endothermic process. And if we could make this uh, very selectively, oxidatively, there would be actually an energy exporting transformation. And on achieving high selectivity, uh, one would achieve reduced greenhouse emission. And as you'll see, we were able to actually simplify the technology, have fewer byproducts, basically on the order of 2 to 3 percent CO and CO2, and only PPM level of oxygenates. This made the separation much easier. And there are operational, uh, fewer operational steps and more economically viable. So looking at the uh, national trends, nearly 30% of the energy consumed is in the manufacturing sector and quite a bit in the uh, chemical sector, about 6.0 quads per year. So if we could tackle this problem, it would be very uh, conducive to our national energy savings. And if you look at the direct correlation between how much energy, uh, primary energy consumed versus a CO2 emission. It's uh, fairly linear and the chemicals are roughly about 22% of that industrial sector. So here at INL, uh, we're beginning to revisit ethylene. We're also looking at many other different chemistries, um, but I'll talk about this one today. So we're building up our staff right now. Uh, I recently joined, uh, we are hiring uh, recently a TAP expert, Dr. Rebecca Fushimi, beginning a TAP uh, laboratory and looking for chemical and chemical engineers, uh, chemists, on a, a, basically a recruit, a recruiting right now. Uh, just this month, we started the Center for Interface Reaction and Catalyst Engineering, CRC, and we're supporting a research with laboratory uh, directed research and development, and also reaching out to uh, DOE offices and the Office of Science. So what, what is our strategy? We want to have an impact on the chemical transformations that will be most impactful and we believe we can save up to 40% of in that process. We're in the beginning stages of forming an industrial consortium. And next year we anticipate starting up a manufacturing development facility. So today the technical part of the talk will um, go over the feedstock, uh, logistics, catalyst development, the uh, kinetic synthesis, proof of concept, and our path forward. So the reaction looks fairly simple, um, but the trick is really to keep it selective, and that's controlled by the catalyst properties. 
and uh, we'll hear about that today. Um, our operating temperatures are below 400 degrees C, so it's fairly low. We're not seeing any background conversion without the catalyst. And in this case, we do have uh, PPM levels of oxygen in the effluent. The uh, potentials are you can achieve very high selectivity, energy savings, simplified downstream processing versus crackers. And um, we believe it, it can be used and demonstrated in a recycle loop. Uh, historically, the uh, family of catalysts you hear about today go back to the 1980s with a work by Union Carbide. And there uh, we're talking about molybdenum vanadium oxide catalyst. And this worked very well, but um, the selectivity wasn't quite high enough, and the actual catalyst was uh, fairly amorphous. Then in the 1990s, Mitsubishi introduced a new catalyst family, uh, the so-called M1, M2 uh, mixed metal oxide structures. And this had improved selectivity. Later on in uh, the 2000s, Dr. Buttery of University of Delaware and co-workers elucidated the um, structure of the M1 catalyst. And uh, a lot of advancements were being made, but we felt that still we weren't at the economic threshold. So this category of molybdenum vanadium niobium based catalysts has had quite a bit of success in commercialization. Uh, with the incorporation of palladium by Sobic, they've converted ethane to acetic acid commercially, incorporating tin. Asahi has a propane to equivalent nitrile commercialization. Antimony addition has led to development stages of propane to equivalent nitrile. And tellurium for propane to acrylic acid. Many companies have investigated that. The uh, talk you hear about today, some of the patents shown here, the uh, data and the uh, patent examples are uh, illustrated. And in our catalyst synthesis, we looked at different prep methods. We had a slurry method, a hydrothermal synthesis, microwave assisted. We looked at different families of catalysts, uh, multiple components with promoters, and conducted characterization work. The uh, slurry method, looks rather involved. It has to be very carefully monitored in terms of pH, temperature. In the slurry phase, a poly polyoxymetalates form under a dry drying procedure and calcination. You can conduct these uh, processes to favor the M1 structure. And then with post-treatment, one can remove the non-selective phases with oxalic acid, extraction, and then we have a special grinding stage where we preferentially expose the active phases. The uh, quick one, Another methodology for getting the hydrothermal uh, synthesis approach, uh, you can prepare the M1 structure this way. And it's uh, slightly different reagents and uh, temperatures are higher. If you incorporate, replace the uh, hydrothermal step uh, par bomb with the uh, microwave, you can reduce the synthesis time down to hours versus days and uh, achieve the catalyst synthesis. The uh, structures are shown here. Um, the preferential phase B is what we were after, the structure in the middle. And here, um, the preferred structure has a five, six, and seven member ring arrangement. The uh, top structure A, uh, we call phase A, which is uh, in the open literature called M2, is um, six member ring ordering and uh, less preferred. So as you can see, the uh, catalyst is needle-like. You can grow up to 200 nanometers in length. The uh, cross-sectional area of the 001 plane is on the order of 20 nanometers. And through our post-treatments, we could uh, preferentially break along the uh, AB plane to expose more of the selective sites. And in the TEM, this is what the structure will look like. And you can see the moldable 
uh, oxidation states of the molybdenum, vanadium, and, and so forth. And this is the uh, work that Doug Buttry and co-workers have elucidated. We ran conventional uh, fixed bed reactor systems to do catalyst evaluations. And um, the gas hourly was 1,200. We could run higher. The data you'll see today is 1,200. And first, we looked at the different prep methods that were outlined and found that uh, in terms of a conversion selectivity curve, they performed in a similar fashion. The uh, microwave catalyst was slightly less active, required uh, slightly higher temperatures. And um, it, this is the uh, performance curve when we looked at different compositions. The um, inclusion of antimony was most preferred giving us selectivities approaching 97%. And then we underwent a different um, optimization of the composition with the tellurium, varying it with the stoichiometry, and saw that the uh, various amounts of M1, M2 in the unknown phase were dependent on the tellurium. The uh, conversion selectivity curve, the optimal tellurium level was coming in at 0.125, and it was also the most uh, active composition. In a uh, similar fashion, we optimized the niobium content, varying it from 0.17 to 0.21. Uh, it was found that too high a level of niobium led to the amorphous phase. And the conversion selectivity curve, we were focusing in on the optimal composition of 0.19, and again, this was the most active. So how does this compare to the uh, commercial cracking of ethane to ethylene, which is um, non-catalytic endothermic? At 70% conversion, we found with this uh, five-component catalyst system of niobium, uh, roughly about 15% higher in selectivity. Then further um, investigations were done. I don't really have enough time to uh, show everything, but we, varied the, we were able to increase the ethane feed content for higher productivity up to 35%. Uh, we were able to dilute the um, use of diluent of steam versus nitrogen, which would be better for plant operating operations and also heat removal, and raise the pressure up to 30 psig. And under these conditions, um, there was good catalyst life on the order of months. So really the next step would be to look at it more from a uh, process scale up viewpoint. And surprisingly, the catalyst, um, our, our concern was if, if you ever had a system upset, it might undergo phase changes. But we were able to oxygen starve it for roughly two hours by raising the operating temperature, up to 390 degrees C, come back, regenerate the catalyst with air, and go back to the operating conditions again and not suffer too much of a loss in selectivity on the order of two to three points. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we thought it would be best to have a PPM level of uh, oxygen in the effluent to maintain catalyst stability and patented uh, finishing catalysts, as we called them, to remove the uh, resi residual oxygen in the effluent. The uh, other concern was that there could be up to possibly 100 ppm acetylene in the uh, product slate. So um, to make this a safer uh, environment for downstream processing, we incorporated very low levels of platinum to finish off the um, acetylene converted to CO2. And we also looked at the tolerance of the ethane feed containing propane um, and saw no negative effect of running a feed of 6% propane and ethane in terms of selectivity. So uh, this short program and research, we felt we had achieved a composition and performance level that was adequate to 
be competitive with the ethylene cracking, the ethylene cracking, and try to address what we thought were key challenges and provide solutions. But as you can see, this type of approach can be fairly uh, time consuming. And um, you know, how can we be more logical about how we do our problem solving? And so as you can see, going from the bench all the way up to manufacturing, this is the illustration of um, like and high dry process, but it's a multi-scale, um, usually very complex, very dynamic, a lot of interactions. The catalyst is almost a, a living entity. It's very responsive to its working environment. And um, for problem solving, really you're looking at usually a bulk crystalline structure. It's uh, polycrystalline. The surface will be very different from the bulk. Usually you're talking about defects, morphous phases, different reaction conditions. It's usually a very complex uh, reaction system as we just spoke about with a multi-component mixed metal oxide. And traditionally people solve the problem looking at it maybe in three different ways. Um, you know, you worry about making the catalyst and then you have to be concerned about characterizing it and then relating it to the uh, reaction kinetics. reaction kinetics and uh, doing an iterative approach that way. In industry, commonly, um, high throughput combinatorial approaches are conducted and uh, this can be, it will generate plenty of data, but a lot of data that has to be mined and uh, fairly intensive. So what we're proposing at INL at our uh, advanced manufacturing center is what we call incremental kinetic synthesis where it's again a cyclic iterative process where you do intrinsic kinetics with a uh, temporal analysis of products um, instrument and this was uh, invented by John Gleaves and he's um, currently working with us and preparing a tap reactor and you can study very complex materials, the actual uh, working industrial catalysts this way. And then apply theory to the kinetic data generated. And uh, Gregory Yablonski um, is leading in this arena, coming up with different uh, first principle theory of interpretation of the uh, data. And the feedback loop is to then look at what do you need to change in the catalyst to get to the um, next step. So you can make very ultra sparse uh, changes, uh, mo sub monolayer changes onto the catalyst surface and then come back and conduct the experimental um, transformation. So we began collaborating back in year 2002 uh, when I was at Roman Haas. Um, Rebecca Fushimi was a graduate student at Washington University. John, uh, of course, is a professor at Washington University. And under a, a Goli grant, we um, studied the atomic tailoring of catalyst surfaces for high selectivity, partial oxidation of propane. So uh, this work has been published and um, we'll talk a little bit about it in the next few slides. So at that time, John Gleaves had the um, first generation TAP reactor system, but did, did not have the uh, methodology developed yet to add the me uh, submonolayer metal, metal oxides onto the catalyst particles. So uh, he and Rebecca developed a, a pulse excimer laser ablation uh, methodology um, to add in a very controlled manner certain amounts. In this case, uh, we looked at palladium on silica first um, as a prototype. And then next took a, a commercial VPO catalyst and uh, added sub monolayer of copper and sub monolayer of tellurium. 
And here's just a, a recap of what the TAP can do for you. Um, you can get a lot of, uh, it's very informational rich. You can determine activation energies, number of active sites, uh, surface concentrations, and um, really get a very fundamental understanding of the microkinetics, and what, what's happening on the catalyst surface. And so we were able to uh, conduct these type of experiments. Um, its advantages are you can run isothermally, so that if you're looking at exothermic reactions, you have good uh, control there. You look at the intrinsic wow. detailed kinetics, and essentially the um, catalyst is a small sandwich in between quartz particles that you locate in the small quartz tubular uh, reactor system. So the molecules are well, de um, really discreetly defined and essentially undergo uh, Knudsen transport. In this case, we're, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at submonolayers of copper and tellurium on the VPO catalyst. And our reactant was 1B18, our product furan. And uh, through multiple pulsing, we were following the normalized yield of furan and seeing improvements with the submonolayer um, depositions of tellurium and copper with fairly good reproducibility. So uh, where do we go from here? Uh, that was the Goloid grant conducted in the early uh, 2000s, and what we're anticipating, the earlier system, um, the deposition was not fully integrated in with the TAP, so one would have to do the deposition and transport the particles over to the TAP reactor. But going forward, we'll be integrating it in a closed system under vacuum, and we're anticipating not only doing the metal atom source, but also having a capability of having nanoparticle addition to the uh, catalyst particles, and uh, which is shown here in this carousel. And then the particles can go be transported over to, over to the sample library and then undergo the uh, TAP temporal analysis of product um, uh, analysis. So this system will be, um, in the future, being constructed. So how does this, um, how do we implement this in our uh, advanced manufacturing? We're envisioning, again, a cyclic iterative uh, process combining experiment with theory. And with the intrinsic kinetic properties, we will be able to gather the uh, critical information of activity, selectivity, absorption constants, rate constants, and really understand individual discrete reaction uh, steps to elucidate uh, mechanistic pathways. And on the physical side of it, in the synthesis, we'll be able to add metals, mixed metal oxides, um, having these different deposition methodologies, and look at the uh, different surface um, compositions, the interfacial areas, be able to titrate the number of active sites and so forth. So it'll be very um, informational rich and we feel that this is a more uh, logical approach for doing uh, catalysis and looking at very complex transformations. And a uh, new design that's under consideration we we'll, we'll use, um, you saw earlier the um, um, laser ablation methodology. Next is anticipated a uh, cathode sputtering mode where you could have different metal, metal oxides available for the um, deposition onto the catalyst particles. So going forward, we're, we're anticipating the arrival of the next uh, state-of-the-art TAP reactor. Um, the, the, well, actually the system in the circle there, with the anticipation with future funding, we'll also incorporate the um, surface synthesis center. And we're uh, seeking collaborations uh, with industry. We anticipate uh, having a 
cons uh, industrial consortium. We'll be having a workhouse and open um, consortium industrial workshop in October. We, we just founded the uh, Center of Interface Reaction and Catalyst Engineering this month. And if you would, if you have time tonight, please stop by uh, the poster session shown there. And you can learn more about the incremental kinetic synthesis, a new approach to complexity for industrial catalysts. And uh, Dr. Fushimi will be there to present. So uh, I joined INL in November, beginning of this year. We're um, establishing the Advanced Manufacturing Center, and we do many things in addition to what you've heard today. We're excellent at separation uh, science, especially with the lamp and knives, and uh, membrane technology, system engineering, and uh, seek to help industry uh, solve critical problems. We're also interacting with the Office of Science, um, seeking to do a very fundamental approach to catalyst design, and looking for ways to um, work with industry. We're very IP favorable, we believe, in terms of uh, creators. We uh, recently formed in 2011 what we call the Center for of Applied of Advanced Energy Sciences, and that's where we'll house our uh, new TAP reactor system, and looking for collaborations with academia and industry there. We anticipate, can't see the lower line, but in 2016, getting funding uh, for what we call the Manufacturing Development Center. So this would be a lot of um, possible piloting and scale up of different technologies. And um, I guess I'm going a little bit fast here, but I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators, uh, Roger Song, who did much of the catalyst synthesis. He um, is recently retired from Anelotech. And Dr. Fushimi with our collaborations at Washington University and now recently joining us at INL. Uh, Dr. Doug Buttry for the characterization work of the various mixed metal oxides that uh, we spoke, uh, mentioned today. And uh, Dr. John Gleaves of Washington University. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for uh, a very interesting lecture and for uh, an early conclusion so we can have more discussions. Uh, there are no questions for, for the individual plenaries. Uh, there is coffee uh, at a break available now. Uh, again, go out to, your, to my right or left uh, through the, uh, the poster session. Thank you.